throughout the ages, those who have truly loved Jesus Christ have loved his church, (laughs) have loved his church. They've loved it as much as the Jewish believers of old loved Zion, the city of God. When John Newton, whom you know as the author of Amazing Grace, wrote that other great hymn that we sang this morning, Glorious things of thee are spoken, Zion, city of our God. It was based upon Psalm 87.3, but it was about the church. The fourth stanza begins, Savior, since of Zion city, I through grace a member am. The Lord loves the gates of Zion as more than all the other dwellings of Jacob, the psalmist wrote. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself for her. The church is his bride. (laughs) How can you love him and not adore his bride? Paul loved the church of Jesus Christ with an undying love. He gave the whole of his life to it. He founded those churches, and when they were strong enough, he would move on and found another one and found another one and found another one. That's a church planter, by the way. I never considered myself a church planter because I'd only planted one church, which seemed awful feeble compared to Paul. Now I've got a second to claim. Maybe I can claim to be a church planter. But he planted churches. He nurtured them. He... he, He return visited them. He strengthened them. He wrote to them. If need be, he corrected them. He prayed constantly. And he worked incessantly. And not just for the church in general, but for each local expression. He never gave up on them, no matter how difficult or challenging or disappointing they might be. Like children, some of those churches were pure joy. Others were EGR, extra grace required. He loved them all. C.S. Lewis wrote in his wonderful book, The Four Loves, love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. The Corinthians wrung Paul's heart, as we'll see in our text this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. If you would turn in your Bibles to that, and then when you get there, if you would stand out of reverence for the reading of his word. 2 Corinthians 2, 1 through 13. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would share in my joy. For I wrote to you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead you ought to forgive and to comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you therefore to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote to you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we're not aware of his schemes. Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, 
I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went off on to Macedonia. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you.